Once again, guys, this is the Investor Show. As always, this is your host, the Prince of Investing, Prince Dykes, coming to you guys all the way live from the beautiful state of Denver, Colorado. And yes, it is snowing. I went from uh, paradise to snowland, but Denver is still beautiful as well. But I thank you guys for tuning in and girls for tuning in all across the globe. I truly appreciate it. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. If you got questions, send me an email at askprinceatroyalfinancials.com. But as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely you don't have I definitely know you don't have a lot of time. So we're gonna jump straight into it. So today, our topic, we're gonna discuss you can't beat the market. So you we're gonna discuss you can't beat the market, so you might as well invest passively. What does that mean, right? We're talking about, you know, a lot of people get out here when you especially when you start to invest, we always think that we can quote unquote beat the market. But there are a lot of things to consider when you try to beat the market. There's a lot of statistical data with that. But with this, I brought in a very, very special guest calling all the way from London, the United Kingdom. We got Mr. Lars Crozier. You have seen him on the show a few times in the past. If Just to give you a brief synopsis of him, he's written um, two great books. I have one with me here, and that's the Demis- uh, Mystified. Uh, great book here. And he is a hedge fund manager, a former hedge fund manager, manager, Harvard graduate, done, you know, been in the industry for how long? He appeared on CNN and all of the other great stuff like that. BBC, I can go on and on and on, right? Very heavily uh, into the financial industry and has been in the financial industry, sits on so many boards and all of the stuff like that. But I'm glad to have him to talk about investing into the market. You're not being able to beat the market. And if you can't beat the market, a better way to invest. But without further ado, Mr. Lars Crowder, how are you doing today, sir? Good, good. Thanks for having me on, friends. It's, a, it's, a, it's good to see you again. And good to see you again. Definitely. I love how you're moaning about the weather in Colorado. I'm in London, and uh, yeah, we uh, we have it worse than you. So. <laughs> <laughs> what you got to think about? I don't it? Know, I, I've been looking upwards the last month, and I don't think I've seen the sun in about a month's time. So. Oh, yeah, that's... I don't know if I can do it at the sun part. Well, we still have the sun. You know, I will say that. You know, it's always someone who has it worse than you. That's right. <laughs> one, of the, one of the big things I wanted to hit on, I wanted to kick this thing off with, Lars. Reading your book, Investing the Mystified, right? Mm-hmm. You spoke on something called edge. And when he's speaking on edge, he was saying that a lot of us think that we have an edge over the market. We think that we're smarter than the market. That's why we buy what we buy. A lot of people do not know what they're up against with the market when they're trying to time the market or beat the market. Mm-hmm. Lars, can you tell us what we're up against? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I think uh, the concept of edge is uh, is perhaps the most important and underappreciated concept in finance. The concept is basically, can you beat the market? Right? So what does that mean? It can mean so many things. But if you take... This is an easy to understand example of the S and P 500. I think we all know what that is, right? It's 500 stocks in the United States, mm-hmm. an index of that weighted by market capitalization. So essentially, an index weighted by the value of those businesses, right? So Facebook's worth 200, and Apple is worth 250. Then it's in those ratio that they would be in the index. So let's say you buy the market. Well, then you're implicitly buying that if, the, if your market is S and P 500. So what is it to have edge over the market or to beat the market? It is to, let's just talk about the S&P 500 uh, stock market or the index. It's essentially that you think you can pick stocks in um, different proportions or pick a subset of the S&P 500 such that you outperform that index. That's what that means. That's to have edge over the S&P 500. Now, it can't be luck. Because luck is, you know, that's not a sustainable thing. So you got to predictably and sustainably beat beat the index. Now, that's just, as it turns out, it's something that sounds easy, right? Because you have 500 stocks. And to do better than the index, all you have to do is to not pick one that's going to do poorly. You think, well, out of 500, surely I can pick one that's going to do poorly and one that's going to do better than the rest of them. But it turns out that it is just incredibly, incredibly hard to do. Um, certainly over a long period of time. 
And certainly after all the costs and expenses that, that investors incur in their, in, in their investing. So, the, so that's really where it starts. So what, when I wrote the book, um, and I later done some videos around this, I try to portray this, like, who is it you're up against? Well, it's obviously the overall market. But instead of making it this sort of faceless mess, I bring up this example of, of like a super skilled fund manager with access to fantastic information, fantastic data, um, access to and friends with all the management of all the businesses he or she invests in. And, and then I put that up against, you know, uh, your typical retail investor. Like you're, you know, the, the, the massive information and analytical disadvantage that the retail investor has versus the professional investor. And I try to, to through that, show how hard it is and get into people's heads that it is just really, really tall order to claim that you can beat the market. So that's really step one. Then step two is to say, well, okay, so I sort of accept that. I accept that I can't just go and know better than the aggregate information that the financial markets have. I can't do better than that. But why don't I just give my money to some super skilled fund manager? And, ha and have him or her pick stocks for me. Um, and there we've got to step, take the next step and go into statistics. And, and when you talk about active uh, management, so man, you buy a, an equity fund, and let's just stay with S&P 500, although this applies to virtually any market in the world. But in the S&P 500, let's say you go and you buy a Fidelity fund or a, some other management, uh, actively managed fund, and you're then saying, well, I can't pick the stocks, but this genius that I've seen in all the ads can pick the stocks. Mm -hmm. Now, statistically, uh, because of all the fees and expenses incurred, paying for the genius, all the people in fancy suits and their travels and the accounting and the auditing and the marketing and all that, only one out of 10 active funds will do better than the index over a 10-year period. Wow. That's actually really, really important to understand that. So if you blindly pick 100 funds that actively pay some genius or some star fund manager to pick a subset of stocks from the S&P 500 so that they can beat the S&P 500 index, only one out of 10 will do so over a 10-year period. Now, there are lots of reasons for that, and we can talk about you know, selection bias and all, all, all these other things. But so then the next question is, if your first realization is, I can't beat the market myself. Your second realization should be, I also can't pick someone to beat the market for me. Wow. So then you say, well, okay, so that's kind of, well, Lars, that I, I, like wanna, bad news, so. I want to slow you down on what you just said there. You were essentially saying that, hey, one out of 10 professional fund manager that has all these resources out there will beat the market over a 10 year period. And that's looking in the rearview mirror. If they did it for mm -hmm. 10 years, how are you going to be able to look into the future? Now, mm -hmm. when you look at things like a mutual fund that are actively managed, you're saying that pretty much one out of 10 over a 10-year period would even beat the market. And that's if you're lucky to pick the right one. Am I following you right on, right on that? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Wow. And so obviously, it's like anything. If you're good enough to pick the best out of 10, you're going to do very well. And nine times, you're going to pick someone who's going to underperform. And um, now, if you go out in the in the financial press and you look at what's out there, you'll see lots of ads saying, "You know, outperformed the market in the last five years, a top performing fund, or superstar manager, this or that." And the reason for that is, let's take the example of Fidelity. And by the way, I have nothing particularly against Fidelity, but uh -huh. um, take the example of Fidelity that may have five hundred different funds. You know, they'll have a fund for anything you can imagine, and um, one of those funds will be number one in all likelihood. Right? So they're not lying in the ads. It's just they're choosing very carefully what they, what they tell you. And all the ones that underperform massively, they disappear and go away. Right? So that's what I mean by selection bias. So we tend to remember the winners. Now, there's also statistically, and I think also like, it's not hard to accept, there is no evidence um, that people, uh, managers that have done well in the past are the same ones that will do well in the future. We can manifest that easily. You just pick the ones that have done well in the past and you're done. Like it's not that easy, right? Mm. 
So if you let's yeah, you know, just go a little back to so you, you come to this acceptance that you can't beat the markets and you can't pick the managers to beat the markets. What should you then do? And this is where I'm saying, if you are that Lars, person, Lars, I want to tag on one more thing that you, you spoke mm-hmm. on earlier. Mm-hmm. You spoke on, you said, hey, if you find a hot fund manager that you decide you want them to manage your money, and you said that uh, you're paying for their lifestyle, their administration, all those stuff like that, you're hitting on to fees. When you say fees, how does fees play into an investment? And can you briefly tell people how fees really add up on an investment? You know, when you're talking about an actively managed fund versus a passive managed fund, can you briefly break that down and how mm-hmm. does how does that affect an investment? Yes, there, there are many there are many fees. Some are explicit and some are implicit, right? So if I buy a fund, a fidelity fund, there will be a management fee. So you pay an amount, so you invest a hundred dollars in a fund. Every year they'll charge you, say, a um, dollar, a dollar twenty-five for owning that fund, right? So for paying for this, um, you know, this star fund manager and all the associates that he or she will have, and for the fidelity brand, and for the marketing, and then for the administration, and the auditing, and the legal, and the documentation, all that stuff. But what you also end up paying for, in addition to that, is that when these people go into the market to put your hundred dollars to use they're also paying trading expenses and bid offer spreads and price impact of 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 their uh, of their trading and so forth so in aggregate these fees add up to a lot more than you think well let's just say let's call it two percent a year in in fees and fees and expenses for an actively managed fund and i just want to put this in just sort of in, in in plain language that anyone can understand. Um, I have this example of someone who drives a train on the London Underground. Now, they're probably, they're paid a lot, which is, <laughs> but mm-hmm. let's do this in dollar terms. I'll try to convert it real time. Let's say they make $50,000 a year and, and they start work at, say, age 26 and they work until they're 65, which is a regular working life. And let's mm-hmm. say that they put 10% of their income every year aside, which is pretty reasonable. And, and let's say they put it all in equities, which they shouldn't. But let's say they do, and let's ignore taxes. Now, let's say that there are two people who do the exact same thing, except one of them does active management, so buying disability or whatever active product, and the other does um, a passive fund, some product that very cheaply simply replicates the index. So an S&P 500 ETF and, um, or something like that. If the over the working life, the stock markets do roughly like they have in the past, which is to say they do roughly 5% a year after inflation, the difference in savings between the guy who invested in the passive, so the index tracker, and the guy who invested in, in the active manager, i.e. the fidelity fund, the difference in savings at retirement will be about $280,000. So Whoa. take that in. So it's basically the equivalent of five Porsche cars right? for someone who has spent their career, you know, driving a train on the London Underground or any other, you know, anyone you know, else with, with that income profile. Now, that's a shocking amount of money for someone in a fairly, you know, a good but regular job and someone who certainly is likely to end up not with massive amounts of, uh, of retirement savings. And that's why it's important. And it's important that people get into their head and they, that whether or not they can beat the market. And hopefully, if they cannot, that the sooner they come to that realization, the better off they're going to be. This is, could easily be one of these Eureka super important moments in someone's financial and overall life. Because in the long run, uh, it'll make a massive positive difference. So I don't want to keep talking here, but like I'm not saying the markets can't be beaten. Mm-hmm. I don't think you have to say that. What you have to say is, can you beat the market? Right? And who are you? Well, whoever whoever is making that decision is you. You know, Kima, I ran a hedge fund for many years, and I'm still invested on the board of hedge funds. 
So it'd be incredibly hypocritical of me to say, in fact, it'd be probably criminal for me to say that I can't beat the market and then go raise money at high fees, right? Because, well, I hope no, if I said that, I hope no one would give me money. <laughs> but it's the wrong question. The question is one that each of us needs to ask ourselves is, can you beat the market? And this is where I'm saying that for the overwhelming majority of people, the answer is no. You cannot beat the market and you should only buy passive investments as a result of that uh, realization. In fact, you should embrace it. Well, you know, you make investing not seem as sexy as it once was, Lars. I will say that. <laughs> because, you know, you think when we think of investing, we think of the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Yeah. The movie. <laughs> the, the movie Wolf yeah. of Wall Street, who's actually been on the show, by the way. Oh, has he? Yeah, What's he yeah. like? Is he a good guy? Yeah, Jordan Buffett has been on the show before. And I'm sure he's a very entertaining and charming guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, definitely is. Uh, definitely got a good way with words and things like that. But I yeah. definitely uh, appreciate Mr. Bell for stopping by. But that's the that's the way Hollywood has, you know, put the world of investing on us. Mm-hmm. Hey, you put a little bit of money to the side and boom, cryptocurrencies take off. They go up a thousand percent. Now you're rich. You pay off your house. Now you're riding around the yacht. So everybody is looking for that type of investment. And now that you said this, you said, hey, listen. The likelihood of you beating the market, not saying you can't, is very slim. Then the likelihood of you going out here and picking a mutual fund or actively managed fund that can actually beat the market on a consistent basis is, again, very slim. And the thing about it, you said the fees, how the fees, $280,000 in that scenario where you had the two people who invested 50, uh, 50, who had an income of $50,000 and invested 10% of the income, how they're going to pay so much more over the future. Now you have me sitting back and you're saying, man, wow, the people on Wall Street have all these connections. They have all these resources and everything like that. You got the fees. You got these things. Now you're asking yourself, okay, I'm a regular Joe Blow. I work a regular job, have a family. How in the heck am I supposed to invest? What would you tell that person? All right, yeah. I, I, I hear you, Mr. Crozier. I hear what you're saying. Now, what's next? What's next? No, it's very well. First of all, I'd say congratulations for coming to that realization. Without <laughs> you even appreciating it at first, your life will already be better because you would naturally ask better questions. Like if you ask questions about your investments and your savings with the premise that you can't beat the markets, then a lot of noise will disappear. You know, you're going to end up not spending so much time reading the financial pages, thinking is Google going to outperform Facebook, et cetera. None of that. It's it's all sort of background noise. What you should do is, and for now, keep in mind, we've talked about equities. Um, you, you need to obviously not just invest in equities, but that d- does depend on who are you as a person. What's your stage of life? How much do you have in savings? What are your other assets? Which is uh, something I think people generally, on they don't think enough about their overall assets in, in, their, um, in their savings plans. But if we stick with one second, just with equities. Whatever you invest in equities, you should invest in the broadest, cheapest, and tax efficient index tracker that you can possibly find. Okay, so we talked about the S and P five hundred before. That's obviously good because it's a you know it's a massive and broad index. But you should really go all the way to the extreme, and you should buy an investment in the world equity index trackers that are out there. Okay, so. There's something Vanguard has one which is excellent, which is called the All World. I think it's called All World Equities or something like that. Stock symbol uh, BP. See, I read. Oh, is that what, yeah, there you go. That's great. Read, one. See, I read your book and I looked it up uh, and I found one. <laughs> BT. So it's kind of a thankless task to be me sometimes because people are always ask me what they should buy, and I kind of stay away from specific products mm-hmm. because a, you really got to think about your individual taxes, and b, the products change all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't care that it's called Vanguard or BlackRock or iShares or whatever it's called. I want the cheapest, broadest, and tax-efficient uh, index track. That's it. For equities, that's all you have to do. Now, when you then think of, which, by the way, let's just stop there for a second. And keep in mind what, we, what I'm saying is I'm saying there's only one equity investment you need to own. You don't need to own anything else. And it is the broadest, most diversified, and the cheapest tax-efficient product. So that's a big part of your investment headaches that have just gone away. Then what you need to do is you need to think about your personal risks, right? Your risk profile is obviously very different whether you're 
someone uh, without a lot of savings and a lot of pressures for future expenses, whether you're young or you're close to retirement, whether you're Bill Gates or or, or basically destitute. I know you saw him, by the way. I saw you, you, you sent me the thing. So oh, the, oh yeah. yeah. Um, but um, so let's just say that you you know what you should do with equity. You should buy this world equity tracker. And let's just say that you could combine that with the lowest risk thing you can get your hands on. So if you're a U.S. citizen, that's the U.S. government bond. Right? So that's the lowest risk. Think of it as cash, except it's better than cash because it might earn you a little bit of interest, although not these days. But also it's, it's you know, the credit of the U.S. government um, as opposed to some bank. Um, and, and I'm here ignoring credit uh, protection stuff. But so say you, have, you can invest in those two parts. One is a government bond or a number of government bonds that roughly have the same kind of time horizon that your investment horizon. Let's say it's 10 years. And the other is this global equity index track. That's two investments. Now, if you allocate between those two according to your risk profile, so a lot of equities if you're very risk hungry and a lot of the bonds if you're very risk averse. So let's say you're someone where it comes out at 50-50. Mm-hmm. That's it. You have created a very robust, theoretically, practically, et cetera, investment portfolio with just two investment products. Now, keep in mind the two investment products represent thousands and thousands of underlying investment because don't forget what an index is. It is an index of, in this case, thousands of equity companies, uh, you know, equities that represent companies all over the world in all sorts of currencies, uh, you know, industries, time zones, etc. Um, and then you combine this with this very low risk thing, which is the US government bond. Um, and you have created, in my view, a portfolio that is better, um, careful what you say, but I think it's better than in the portfolio than 99 percent of retail investors have today. So, Mr. Large Court, you're telling us that we need two things. You're saying get a, a worldwide uh, ETF, equity ETF. Well, not ETF, but passive passive investment. Yeah. It's often, uh, ETF is, a, is, is what you call, I don't want to get too technical, but you call it an access product, which I think is a fancy term. It basically means it's an investment that gives you access to something, right? So in this case, an ETF gives you access to global equities. In the old days, there were people used to the index funds, which is another access product. But essentially, think of that's what you want. You want something that is incredibly broad and very cheap. And ETFs are a good choice. Okay. Because I don't know what may come out in the future. I mean, exactly. do whatever the case may happen. But okay, so you're saying, hey, get a broad index, get a world index, equities. Mm-hmm. Then you say, get a U.S. government bonds, maybe you could get an ETF in that too. You can. And that's it. The end. That's the end of my portfolio. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, can, we can turn off now. now but then you, got, <laughs> you, get, you, gotta, you gotta then allocate between those two depending on your risk profile, right? And you gotta think about tax. I don't wanna, you know, it's something that's easy to assume away, but keep in mind, some of these things are hard to talk about in general terms because you know, your tax situation is different from mine. Your risk situation is different from mine, right? So that's something where you do um, need to think about your, your your individual situation. And maybe you should consider getting some help from a financial advisor to think through those things. Right? I will say, I'll contrast that to what's currently the case for many people, which is, you know, spend a ton of time actively trading the stock market without statistically doing better. In fact, they will typically do far worse than the stock market just because of all the costs and the fees and the hidden fees, the custody fees and so forth, and the taxes. Uh, don't forget to pay them. Um, and, 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 and I think importantly, the time, just the amount of time people spend doing this stuff when it is not their day job. Mm. And, and I think oftentimes there's tremendous naivete in thinking you can sit Saturday morning in your boxer shorts and read the financial pages and somehow pick stocks that does better than the aggregate knowledge of the hundred trillion dollar financial industry. That I mean it's now, just it's now, just quite now, unlikely, right? You being someone who's been on BBC, CNN, all type of financial well, there are a lot of people on there. 
<laughs> that's, that is true, but <laughs> don't, don't read too much into that. Now, you know, you're someone that's been behind the curtain, right? And I'm the person who wakes up in the morning, I'm reading my phone, and I'm getting the native stock. You sound, you sound like my daughters right now. <laughs> it's, they, it's, they don't read about stocks. <laughs> so you're reading about your stocks, you're reading, you're picking up the newspaper, you're picking up books, and you're, you know, uh, it's kind of becomes convoluted. You're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, well, what do you mean just get bonds and stocks and just forget about it? When I see this person who's made a million dollars and trillion dollars and done so well in investing, you know, you know, cryptocurrencies are the next big thing and, uh, you know, silver, gold or whatever the hot thing that will come out this year. It happens every single year. What you? Why would you? Let me just stop you there, if I, if you don't mind. If you are someone who knows, and I don't mean in uncertain terms, like we all know stuff. Mm -hmm. If you know what is the next big thing, yeah, by all means, go make money from it. Like if you a year ago had known, I don't know, through magic or incredible analytical insight, that bitcoins were going to go up a thousand percent, of course you should go buy that. Of course you should. Just like if you know that Facebook is going to double, of course you should go buy that. I'm just saying that it's overwhelmingly likely that you don't know because very few people do know. Mm -hmm. or very few people can predict the future. <laughs> um, and you're up against a lot of incredibly well-resourced people that do this for a living and get paid a lot of money and have access to better information than you, better analytics than you. and and they do it all day, and they were themselves very often you know, chosen to do that among a lot of people that are trying to get those jobs. So they're probably pretty good at what they do. And you're trying to do something better than them. It's pretty hard. But, of course, if you know that, if you know what the next big thing is, absolutely, go make money. But the, 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 the thing I want to hit on, Lars, is what gives people so much confidence is the financial media. And can you speak on how marketing goes with, you know, how you said about Fidelity, where they say, oh, this is our best, our hottest fund. And mm -hmm. hey, this is our hottest stock. Or look at this guy who made the trillion dollars here or there. Mm -hmm. How they are not telling you about the other thousands of funds mm -hmm. and the thousands of people they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I look, okay, so I'm, I've been on, I know a lot of people over at CNBC, for example, right? Um, and I've been on there a bunch. And... It's kind of interesting. So what are they as a business? Right? They're, they're obviously a media company. And I think to some extent, almost an entertainment company. So the reason is I'm not a great guy to have on a lot. So I'm typically the guy they bring on a couple of times and then make me go away. Because what I'm saying is don't spend your day looking at CNBC and their next hot stock tips. Because you're not going to do better. Right? Go spend your day doing something else and buy a passive index fund. So there, there is a tremendous amount of vested interest in having you pick the stocks or pick the funds can pay the fees and sustain this whole mill of you know journalists fund managers brokers i don't know the, and the poor salespeople. i don't know there are a lot of people i mean keep in mind the example before two hundred eighty thousand dollars, which by the way is in present money terms so that's inflation adjusted that's today's money um that's two hundred eighty thousand dollars that ends up in someone else's pocket for a guy who drives a train. Right? There's a lot of money going around in this circle, and a lot of vested interest in seeing that continue. And there are very few people taking the other side, because who's really incentivized to see to 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 to, to tell you this? I mean, there are very few people that are that are actually personally incentivized, including yourself. It can be so harsh, like you know. If everyone did what I say they should do, they should not be listening to, you know, they should not spend their day listening on how to make great investments, mm. right? Because they should put their money in these passive products, think about their risk and their taxes, and then go do other stuff. And Lars, I'm, I grew to 100%. And the thing about this show that I think is uh, different from everything that's out there, it's more financial literacy, you know? Yeah, no, that's good. Say. And by the way, can I just commend you on your books, your children's books? I think that's just brilliant. And oh, now you have promoted it yourself, but everyone should have their kids read some of this stuff. It's just <laughs> setting them up better for the future. That cannot be a bad thing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That, that means a lot, especially coming from someone like yourself. Uh, and I definitely appreciate your support and coming on to the show. And 
I mean, that's the thing I try to instill in the people's head is that with this show, I don't tell you to go pick up this hot new stock and this is the hot new thing. Hey, it's just about financial literacy, financial education, knowing what the index is, knowing what you're up against when you go start that E-Trade, Scott Trade account, knowing what the motive is behind people, because these are things that I didn't know. These are these yeah. are the paths that I went down and that I, I as I'm uncovering them, I'm letting other people know. So this yeah. is, you know, and I, this I, is I another thing that. about investments that, that a lot of people I would encourage people to think about is, you know, we've been talking about an investment portfolio, um, but in reality, uh, most of the time, well, always your investment portfolio is one part of your financial uh, life or your financial assets. And you sometimes you'll own a house, you'll have a job, you'll have an education in a certain area or a certain geography. When you think about all your assets, or even you might even consider future inheritance or past debts. These are all things that play into your your uh, uh, your overall financial assets. But what you find very often is that if you wrote them all down and try to put some sort of a value to these things, and um, they are often very local, like your house, your job, your education, your language. Um, your skill set, your ability to learn new skills, they're often very much locally based. So imagine you took all those sort of sometimes even intangible assets and, and then you took your investment portfolio and you added to that concentration risk by buying local investments. That would be really silly, right? Because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. By buying at least investment products, the global equities, you're diversifying away from some of this local risk. Now, in the past, this is why it's actually it's interesting here in the UK. The UK stock market represents I don't know, it's a 5% of the global equity markets, roughly. Right? The US is 4 to 35 or something like that. But yet, if you look at the investments in the UK pensions industry, so these are people's retirement savings, it's like 50% UK stocks. So they're taking a lot of concentration risk that they don't have to take. And then people we can talk about currency and so on, but ignore that for a second. It, but if you think about your own individual position, a lot of your risks are highly correlated. So make sure your investment portfolio is not also that. Make sure it's diversity. Diversify. Okay. Well, Lars, you know, we're out of time again. It's always, you know, I know other people say, hey, uh, you know, other financial Shows may say, you know, I mean, I'm just a regular old dude, you know, I'm not one of the big conglomerates, or anything like that. But my thing is, it's always a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure. No, it's a pleasure, Brent. I think you're doing a great thing. I really, I think it's brilliant, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to help if I can. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for coming by. Once again, guys, this is Mr. Lawrence Croger calling with him from the UK and London. My name is Prince Dax. This is the Prince of Investing. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, comment, share button. Of whatever it is you do. And if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like the video, give it a thumbs up anyway. But until the next video, podcast, whatever you see me do, crazy around the globe, please be safe and I'm out and thank you. Yeah.